job. There you have it. They finally got R. Kelly, and I guess something finally gonna happen now that the feds then stepped in. I guess these parents can finally get their children back, and other parents ain't gotta worry about the predator being out there anymore. So I'm definitely happy that he finally getting ready to get uh what's coming to him. Um, <laughs> it has surely been a long time overdue. Long, long overdue. He been playing with these girls' lives and for for too too long. So he finally getting what's coming to him. Uh, as far as his girlfriends, I don't know if they happy to really go home that they got him or he they really in love with him. But time will tell. We'll see what turns out, how things turn out. Uh, that's all I really had to say. It is 1.36 in the morning. Time for me to take my butt to sleep. <laughs> I haven't been recording in a while. I've been out of the country. And then I came back and haven't been feeling well. So I said, well, feeling better today. I said, let me get up and record a little something. So here you have it. He's finally caught. Going to be turned over to the feds. The only thing I can say, he better hope they don't take him to New York. Because if he go to New York, he'll surely be in Rikers Island. And he don't want to go to Rikers Island. Because if he go there, I feel sorry for him, even though they're going to have him in PC. But he better hold on to that soap real tight and don't drop it. Because <laughs> if he drop the soap, Whoops, that's it. <laughs> but anyway, good night, people. B and pop music star R. Kelly is due back in court tomorrow, facing more charges of sexual abuse. Federal investigators are weighing charges as well. It is all a striking change in fortune. Yamiche Alcindor is back with a conversation we recently recorded with a journalist who has long pursued this story. It's the latest installment of our bookshelf. For years, there have been allegations and rumors about R. Kelly's behavior. There was a trial, an acquittal, and then even more accusations. Then this winter, concerns intensified. In January, a six-hour documentary detailed allegations of R. Kelly mistreating and sexually abusing women, many of them minors, even as his career thrived. In February, the star was charged with aggravated criminal sexual abuse involving four women, three of whom were under the age of consent at the time of the abuse. He turned himself into Chicago police and was eventually released on bail. His record company also dropped him. Kelly has been repeatedly denying committing any criminal behavior. A new book, Solace, The Case Against R. Kelly, chronicles the singer's history and the lives of a number of his accusers. It's the culmination of almost two decades of reporting by journalist Jim DeRogatis. He is a former music critic for the Chicago Sun-Times and a co-host of the public radio show Sound Opinions. Thanks, Jim, so much for being here. Almost two decades ago now, you got an anonymous fax that really changed the course of your career. Um, it said, Robert has a problem with young girls. Tell me a little bit about how you got into investigating R. Kelly and what sources told you about his behavior. As the pop music critic at the Chicago Sun-Times, I got a lot of hate mail. And I initially tossed this fax uh, on the slush pile of press releases and hate letters that I was going to throw away. Um, but it was it was a single spaced uh, page long fax that had a lot of names and details and dates and a, a certain tone. Robert needs help. Robert needs to stop. He has to stop hurting young girls. And I didn't think that a random hater um, would would show that kind of compassion. You mean, I'd always been a reporter first and foremost. I'd spent five years at the Jersey Journal covering uh, crooked uh, politicians and mobsters. I threw myself into this story because young women were telling me they were being hurt. And I stayed on the story for 19 years because those calls never stopped coming. And as a journalist, and I think as a human being, if a young woman is calling you and saying, I've been hurt, no one will listen to me, 
the the courts, the cops are not taking me seriously. Can I tell you my story? Um, uh, that's that's the job you and I do, isn't it? You write that the lives of 48 women were either damaged or destroyed by R. Kelly. You also write that you think thousands of people knew. How could R. Kelly have gotten away with these alleged crimes for so long? Well, R. Kelly was, you know, if he earned a quarter of a billion dollars, as my sources say, uh, Jive Records earned a full billion. And Clive Calder and Barry Weiss were the executives running this label. They have a very poor record of their artists being treated uh, horribly or their problems ignored. And they know about R. Kelly because young women name them as a party to the lawsuits. The music industry had no interest in shutting him down. He was making them way too much money. And then the book is a unique Chicago story. In Chicago, the churches failed, the schools failed, the journalists failed, the courts failed. Uh, later on, the police failed. Uh, everyone failed these young black women that he preyed on. You know, I have said no one matters less in society than young black girls. And when I say that, I'm saying it because dozens of young black women have said that to me, and I'm just trying to amplify what they're saying as a journalist. How did R. Kelly being black and most of his victims being black women factor into the way that these alleged crimes were viewed? I've always wrestled with that question because, you know, people would throw at me and at, at the, the, you know, Abdin Palish, another white journalist I was working with, you are trying to down a successful black man. And yet we have talked to so many young black women whose lives were hurt and, and ruined, I say. I mean, they, some attempted suicide, according to court documents, according to what they told us, according to the scars on the wrists that I've seen. Uh, I never understood why those black women mattered less than this black superstar. It's not a book I wanted to write, you mean. It's just a dark and horrible place to live. Mm -hmm. But I thought it was necessary because above and beyond the case needing to be made that this is the worst predator in the history of popular music, and I know that sounds hyperbolic, you know, men have been treating women badly in the music world way before Sinatra and way after Chris Brown. Nobody, I believe, has racked up the body count, 48 young women, lives ruined. And when I say lives ruined, that's not hyperbole. Many of these young women dreamed of being a singer. Their careers were destroyed. R. Kelly sat down with CBS News' Gail King. He was angry. He was emotional. How does that square with what you've seen and heard from sources? Kelly is a masterful manipulator of the media. And he was delivering an Oscar-worthy performance. And I'm not the only one. There were people on set who told me the same thing in that interview. Um, he believes he can spin his way out of trouble. He's under indictment in Illinois on very serious charges. Ten charges originally, 11 more additional charges uh, were added. But there was a federal investigation, three federal investigations, the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, and the IRS that are looking at uh, obstruction of justice, tax evasion, sex trafficking, and transporting underage girls across state lines for immoral purposes. Do you think that people are taking these alleged crimes more seriously this time around, and if so, why? I think that people still don't realize the scope of these crimes, that they start in 1991, and they are continuing even as you and I speak. That's why I thought this book was necessary. But when I sat with Dominique Gardner and tell her story for the first time in the book. And I asked her, you're a smart, beautiful young woman, a talented poet. Why did you spend nine years with him? I loved him and he loved me. And mm -hmm. yes, he beat me with an extension cord. And yes, he choked me and starved me. But I loved him. But Dominique, why? And she finally pulled up his mugshot, uh, Yamish, on her cell phone. And she held it up and said, them eyes, Jim. It was them eyes. Mm -hmm. There's the power of the music, there's the celebrity, there's the fame, there's young girls who believe that they will be the next Aaliyah, and then there's this other thing that I think we're going to be trying to parse for, uh, for years to come. Well, thank you so much for joining us. The book is Solace, the Case Against R. Kelly, Jim Diragatis. Thank you. Thank you, Yamish. ...told associate number one that he would be, quote, dead, close quote if another copy of the first tape surfaced. Mr. Kelly also bragged to associate number one
that he had dotted his I's and crossed his T's, quote, unquote, and that the young girl who was depicted in the videos and the young girl's family would not testify against him in connection with the trial because he had relocated them and paid them off. It was subsequently learned that Mr. Kelly, through multiple means, had paid the young victim and her family over $2 million not to testify and come forward in connection with the 2008 trial. So to those R. Kelly fans who want to talk about the 2008 trial and the fact that he was acquitted, it was bogus. R. Kelly bought his acquittal. He bought this victim and their parents and ensured that the truth was never told to that jury in 2008. There were subsequent disputes between Mr. Kelly and associate number one relating to the payment of the monies for the recovery of the first tape. Those were documented contemporaneously, meaning there are contemporaneous documents from that time period, making it impossible for this to have only now been fabricated. On one occasion, Mr. Kelly and Mr. McDavid paid associate number one approximately 160 to $170,000 in cash contained inside a shopping bag. This was during the 2008 trial, and it was done to ensure that associate number one did not come forward and describe the obstruction of justice that had been carried out at the request of Mr. Kelly. Ultimately, a copy of that first videotape was provided to Ms. Fox's office by me in February of 2019, earlier this year. There is no question relating to the chain of custody of that videotape, what it represents, whether R. Kelly is on it, whether he paid a significant sum of money together with others, in order to attempt to bury it and prevent the truth from coming out. Be clear, R. Kelly and those around him obstructed justice in connection with the 2008 trial. Those are some of the charges that he now faces. And I am highly confident that when all the evidence is heard, that he will be convicted along with others around him of obstructing justice in connection with the 2008 trial. We have now provided two videotapes to law enforcement we are presently trying to locate a third videotape that we know exists. That is the tape with Ms. Van Allen, Mr. Kelly, and the 14-year-old girl. The reports of 20 videotapes being provided to law enforcement are completely bogus, ridiculous, absurd, nonsensical. I don't know what other words I can use. Whoever is reporting that should be ashamed of themselves because whatever source they're using is ridiculous, bogus, not credible. Ladies and gentlemen, it hasn't happened. 20 videotapes have not been turned over to law enforcement. What else is bogus and ridiculous? This story that recently was reported about the two young ladies, Ms. Savage and Ms. Clary, being evicted from the Trump Tower. Whoever reported that, you should be ashamed of yourself. You're not a journalist. It's disgraceful. Stop worrying about clicks and do your job. Those young ladies have not been depicted. They may or be, uh, have not been evicted. They may be evicted 
within 30 days, but they presently have not been evicted. Why do I care about this? Why do I care whether this false information about 20 videotapes, etc., is out there? I'll tell you exactly why I care. This is a serious matter, and I want to ensure that justice is done here. The media has a responsibility to get it right. There's a lot of people out there that are trying to plant bogus stories only so they could be knocked down. What did we see earlier today? We saw the eviction story being knocked down by the two young ladies. They posted a video of them sitting in the Trump Tower. Am I surprised by that? No, because I knew it was false. Before the press reports on facts relating to this, you need to ask questions as to where this information is coming from and whether the individuals have any basis to actually know about it. A major national network contacted me on Saturday or Sunday and asked me if both Ms. Savage and Ms. Clary were in Atlanta. They had received a report that they were in Atlanta and they were getting ready to run the story. I represent Alice and Angelo Clary. I still represent them. They are in touch with their daughter. She is here in Chicago. She never went to Atlanta. Ms. Savage also has not gone to Atlanta. Once again, I don't know where this information is coming from. It's not accurate. As it relates to Alice and Angelo Clary, like I said, they are in contact with their daughter. They are in the process of trying to be reunited with their daughter. They hope to be reunited with their daughter shortly. Obviously, this has been a very long road for both their daughter and them. And you can only imagine the amount of time that it's going to take for that relationship to be repaired. I want to address one more issue before I take questions. The people that on social be the people on social media and others that are talking about the fact that this is somehow driven by racism or bigotry should be ashamed of themselves. Every one of my clients is African American. This doesn't have anything to do with race. This has everything to do with justice and what's right and wrong. Many of the investigators are African American. This is a case about young girls, many of whom came from rough neighborhoods who were economically disadvantaged and were easily preyed upon by a guy who used his power and wealth and contacts to get away with it for almost 30 years. That's what this case is about. It's not about black and white. It's about right and wrong. So I'll be happy to take some questions. Yep. Explain to them again. You said there's two, there's three, turned over two or three tapes. What are they of? There's one of Mr. Kelly and the young woman, and there's one of a young woman with an older woman. Kind of walk me through the sure. tapes you turned over. We, we have turned over um, two tapes, both tapes, uh, to pick Mr. Kelly uh, with a girl who is 14 years of age. Same girl. Same girl, clearly depict. Mr. Kelly, there's no question that it's him. The mole is clearly visible on his back. Uh, they both, the young girl and Mr. Kelly, reference the fact that she's 14 on both of these tapes. There's a third tape that we are trying to locate. That tape, we understand, depicts Mr. Kelly with the same 14-year-old girl together with Miss Lisa Van Allen. Just to follow up on that, who did you give the tape? We, we initially provided the tapes to Cook County, and they in turn provided them to federal law enforcement. And the, your third tape, is that the fourth tape that the prosecutors in Chicago, there were prosecutors in Chicago have? No. They don't have? No. No. This is a separate case. Correct. And did these tapes have to do with the case, the federal case in Chicago or New York? Well, the, the tape, I think the tapes would be used as evidence in all of the cases, both in the state case as well as both federal cases. What do you make of the allegations? Well, I certainly think that there's substantial evidence of that um, in light of how long this 
occurred, where it occurred, the number of states um, that were involved. Uh, this was not some isolated incident. I mean, you are talking about literally dozens of victims. Did you just you said that you mentioned that uh, the Claridge have been in touch with their daughter. What is the progress of those talks? And why do you believe that they will, in fact, meet again? Well, the progress is incremental. Again, as you can imagine, this is a very emotional time. Uh, I think that Miss Clary and Miss Savage um, likely will slowly come to the realization um, that this is over. And when I say it's over, I'd be very, very surprised if Mr. Kelly ever sees the light of day again outside of federal custody at this point in his life. I do not think he will be granted bail in connection with both of these proceedings. And I believe that ultimately he will serve a lengthy uh, and rightful prison sentence for his decades of abuse. I think it's going to take time for both of them to come to that realization. Uh, you know, these two young ladies have been brainwashed for the better part of two, three, four years in many instances. They've been fed uh, quite a story by uh, Mr. Kelly. Uh, and from what I've heard and the evidence that I've seen, uh, this man is a sociopath. In, in every, in every uh, term, in every way, every sense of the word, the conduct that this man engaged in, had he not been as successful uh, as a songwriter and performer, he would have been locked up for the rest of his life a long time ago. What's the nature of the talks that Ezreal had with her parents? Are we talking about text messages, actual phone calls that are long? Uh, they've had text messages and... Uh, telephonic communications. I don't want to get into the details of what they discussed because, again, I don't want to violate their privacy. Uh, but this is going to be an incremental uh, and slow process. And, and I'm hopeful, and they're hopeful, that they're going to be able to rebuild the relationship with their daughter, who they love very much. And when was the last time they had contact? Today, yesterday? Uh, I believe yesterday. The federal charges, uh, combined with the state charges, seem to identify about 10 people. There might be some over about 10 victims. If you talk about dozens on top of dozens, are there a lot of unidentified victims? Are the feds still working to track them down? Why do you say there are dozens and dozens? There's a number of unidentified victims, and there's a number of other identified victims who have not been cooperative thus far with law enforcement and have not been willing to um, provide interviews or statements to law enforcement. And I believe that the hope is that as time progresses uh, and as people begin to realize that again, this is over. In today about the criminal cases against singer R. Kelly. Toby Jens, Megan Dwyer has been following this case and is joining us now with more on what happened. Yeah, Lourdes and Ben, supposedly R. Kelly was so desperate to cover his tracks, he paid people to find these tech sex tapes and destroy them. But today we learned some of these whistleblowers actually made copies of those tapes. We are also hearing more details about how much money Kelly paid out to victims and their families to allegedly keep them quiet. I'd be very, very surprised if Mr. Kelly ever sees the light of day again outside of federal custody at this point in his life. Today, Michael Avenatti held court at the Four Seasons in Chicago. The videotapes don't lie. Dozens of witnesses don't lie. These whistleblowers don't lie. He says he gave Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox the first of two new sex tapes back in February, and she turned that tape over to federal authorities. It was all about money. Numerous adults, men and women, turned a blind eye to sexual assault of young girls because they didn't want the gravy train known as R. Kelly to end. While the two new tapes purportedly show Kelly having graphic sex with a 14-year-old girl, there are also new victims and girls who were not part of his trial back in 2008. So even though the one is the same girl, it's not double jeopardy. There's other minors involved. There are new tapes. Uh, it is not all old news. Kelly was arrested last week for allegedly paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to recover child sex tapes that went missing from his stash. New court documents unsealed last week in Chicago suggest Kelly pressured witnesses to change their stories before his pornography trial a decade ago. And now in New York, he faces unprecedented racketeering charges normally reserved for drug dealers and mobsters. They charge him in New York with... Um enticing people and encouraging people to have sex with them. Uh, I don't think people accidentally have sex. 
Uh, so I'm not really sure what the criminal activity is there. Kelly's attorney told WGN Morning News he's hopeful the singer will be released from jail tomorrow. He's obviously not a flight risk. Everyone's known these charges are coming and he hasn't, hasn't fled. While 10 girls are mentioned in the recent indictments, Avenatti says there are at least 14 victims, girls from rough neighborhoods in Chicago who were easily preyed upon for the last 30 years. To those R. Kelly fans who want to talk about the 2008 trial and the fact that he was acquitted, it was bogus. R. Kelly bought his acquittal. Today, Avenatti also said girls were abused in both Florida and in Indiana, in addition to New York and Chicago, and he does expect more charges to be announced at some point against other members of R. Kelly's entourage. R. Kelly is expected to be back in court tomorrow. And that's when we find out whether or not he gets held until the trial? Whether he can post mm -hmm. bail right. and whether he might have to go back to New York. Okay. We'll okay. see. Thank you, Megan. Appreciate it. As he awaits his arraignment on the new federal charges against him. Kelly was arrested Thursday on a 13-count indictment that includes sex crimes and obstruction of justice. Another indictment in New York charges him with racketeering and sex-related crimes. A judge is expected to rule on possible bail during a hearing tomorrow. Kelly was released on bail after he pleaded not guilty to state charges of sexually abusing three girls and a woman in Illinois. Jim DeRogatis is the co-host of Sound Opinions on WBEZ, the author of the new book, Soulless, The Case Against R. Kelly. He joins us now in the studio. Good morning, Jim. Good morning. Well, one of the yeah. first people to break this story, how many years ago, Jim? It was... In the Sun-Times, yeah. and yeah. it's... Now you've got to be going... What is different this time around? I remember when we had yeah. you on, you were one of the first ones to say, it's the federal charges that are yeah. going to come down. Right. Uh, these federal charges are unprecedented in the history of popular music. I mean, I'm a music critic and scholar. No one has ever been hit with criminal sexual abuse charges as broad, as deep, as far-ranging as R. Kelly. I mean, Chicago now has another supervillain on the order of a Gacy or a Capone. This is historic. Um, yeah, and these are really coming at him from all angles. I mean, you have the, the charges here in Illinois. You have the federal charges on the child pornography here. You have the stuff that's happening in New York. And all of this kind of coming together, you get the sense that everything's sort of closing in on him at this point. Absolutely. And I think the New York charges that are charging him under RICO, that this is a criminal enterprise that went on for 20 years of enablers, uh, manager, uh, right-hand men, uh, runners, uh, all enabling while building his musical brand, him to pursue this compulsion of chasing underage girls' sexual contact with minors. It That's new. Never. I mean, you know, the Rolling Stones have never been charged as a criminal enterprise. Uh, you know, it, it's unprecedented. And then the child pornography and violations of the Mann Act, which as a student of pop music history, Chuck Berry's career was derailed in 1959 when he was arrested for transporting one teenager across state lines. There are ten mentioned in the two indictments uh, for Kelly. Some of those have filed civil suits. One of them is in the 2008 trial. She is now cooperating with federal authorities and the indictment says he bribed her and her family to lie to the grand jury in 2008. We have wondered since 2008 how was he acquitted with 30 minutes of video evidence he bribed his way, and the Illinois case fell apart. And the judge, Judge Vincent Cohen, would not allow prosecutors, state prosecutors, to bring that evidence in. Well, I'm sure our Kelly's attorney, Steve Greenberg, who we'll be talking to at 7.30, would say, these are old charges, and is He's, there any double jeopardy if we're talking no. about the girl that's on that original tape? This, How is it different? By my count, there are five new tapes mentioned in these two federal indictments involving four minors. So even though the one is the same girl, it's not double jeopardy. There's other minors involved. There are new tapes. Uh, it is not all old news. Some of the charges uh, date from 2017 of him transporting underage women across state lines for sexual contact. Don't let Greenberg give you that. And I would love to hear him address the fact that no one in the history of popular music has faced charges this big. There are some reports that there are maybe 20 tapes that the 
feds have been given and that some of these tapes came from his inner circle, R. Kelly's inner circle, giving them these tapes. Yeah. Now you have others implicated. Do you see some of these people potentially flipping, or are you surprised that some people in his inner circle now are yeah. maybe cooperating and giving that material to the federal? There government? have been people of good conscience in his inner circle who split after X number of years, going back to the mid-90s. Um, you know, the credibility of some of these people, having witnessed awful things for a very long time and then walking away, uh, the courts will judge that. But I, I have known for years that there are dozens of tapes out there. I don't know if I believe TMZ's reporting that the feds have 20. The feds are saying they have five, mm -hmm. right, which is four more than they had. Uh, but do that many tapes exist? Yes. And will Daryl McDavid, his longtime manager, and June Brown, his longtime, he was the guy who would, one of the guys who would press the little balled up piece of paper into the girls' hands. Will they try to get a deal for themselves and flip? If not them, there are plenty of other people the feds are looking at. I mean, they spent months and months and months with 50 or 60 FBI and Homeland Security agents on this. They didn't leak a thing, you know. They didn't hold a press conference. They just did their job. And, you know, the book I never wanted to write is about how this happened for 30 years, dating to 1991, and now it's time for us to look at the reckoning. The churches failed, the courts failed, the civil attorneys failed, the journalists failed. I mean, this, this was a monster that got away with it for long. There'll be a lot of other stories. Other scandals will come out, and, and the testimony and the trials, but, but for all intents and purposes, it's done. Finally. Well, Jim's book is Soulless, The Case Against R. Kelly, available now on Amazon, coming up at 7.30. As I mentioned, we're going to be talking to Steve Greenberg, R. Kelly's attorney. Thanks for being here, Thanks Jim. Thanks for coming. Sure, on. you bet. Thursday on his most serious charges yet, he now faces 11 new counts of sexual assault and abuse. The R&B star denies all of the charges. In an exclusive CTM interview back in March, he insisted that he has done nothing wrong. I didn't do this stuff. This is not me, y'all. I'm fighting for my life. Y'all tell me with this. I got him by him. I'm a by him. Robert. I got him in my career. Y'all trying to kill me. Nearly 20 years ago, music critic Jem DeRogatis helped break the first story on claims against R. Kelly. In his new book, it's called Soulless, The Case Against R. Kelly. He says he knows of 48 women who were allegedly abused by the singer over 30 years. R. Kelly's attorney told us this, quote, I have not read his book, nor do I care what he says. We will worry about the court and not Mr. D. Rogatis. Jim D. Rogatis joins us at the table to discuss. Good morning. Really good to have you here. Hi, Gail. Thanks. I was fascinated by your book because I'm thinking I heard about this, 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 this. But for you, this started around Thanksgiving 2000. You get a fax, you even bought a copy of the fax. You get a fax at, you get a fax at your job, and it says what? What do you do with it? it? I throw it on the slush pile of hate mail and press releases that I'm going to ignore, because any time I wrote about hip-hop, that's not music, it's noise. Yeah. Or if I dared criticize the Rolling Stones or a baby boom icon. But there was a tone in that fax. Dear Mr. Goddess, dear Goddess, I'm writing to you hoping you can help. Robert has a problem. His problem is young, young girls. girls yeah. I slept on it that holiday weekend, and I went back to, I, I added science. I went in the office once a week to get my mail, file expenses, and leave, you know, mm -hmm. before the editors could give me more work mm -hmm. uh, as pop music critic. And there was a level of specificity, and a young woman named Tiffany Hawkins, who it alleged had filed a lawsuit for having a sexual contact with Kelly uh, at age 15. He picked her up uh, in, in, in her choir class at Kenwood Academy. And 20 I, years later, though, Jim, we are yeah. still talking about these kind of allegations. Yes. And 20 years later, he has still not gone to jail. Right. Why? Every system in Chicago has failed dozens of young black women, Gail. The courts, the churches, the schools, journalism, the music journalism, industry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, it was me and another reporter, Abdin Palish, and a brilliant columnist who's a hero of mine, Mary Mitchell. Mm -hmm. And that was it. Yeah. For until... Recent months, really, everybody wanted to dismiss these charges because, and I'm only echoing what dozens of young black girls have told me, for 19 years, nobody matters less in our society than young black girls. You write, Jim, that you say, I, I put the number of people who knew about or witnessed that damage in the thousands. In the thousands. From record company uh, publicists and tape operators to... Uh, 
Clive Calder, the president of Jive Records, you know, Barry Weiss, uh, you know, Reverend Jesse Jackson, one of his spiritual champions. They deny that they know. Barry Weiss says, listen, I'm running a record company. He, he Jive Records was know. named in lawsuits filed by underage girls. Mm -hmm. And if you're being sued uh, as a party on a $10 million lawsuit by a 15-year-old girl, you know. You said, you, I mean, you, you heard people for years, they would say, R. Kelly likes them young. It was, it was, it's the worst fact. It sounds like hyperbole when I say this, Gail. But if you go to Chicago on the south and west side and you talk to two, or you talk to three black women, two will have stories. Not, not that they've been, a, but them or their sister or their aunt or their cousin or their mom has been at Kenwood Academy or the Evergreen Plaza shopping mall, mall or the Rock and Roll McDonald's when Kelly was cruising. But back to Anthony's point, they say that Since he has a problem with young girls. They don't call him a pedophile. They just think he has a problem and he needs to get help. Even the women who are with him don't seem to be mad at him. They just think, we just need to help this guy. The hate that's coming my way, your way, and most troublingly, the way of the young women who've accused him, the social media hatred, um, it's just a lie. The most common statement I've heard in 19 years of reporting this story is, brother needs help. Brother's got to stop. Jim, R. Kelly's attorneys say you have agenda. You're not just doing reporting. Right. You draw a conclusion here. Your response? I've sat with 48 women who've done the most difficult thing a woman can do, to tear out her soul and talk about their sexual assault to a stranger and put their name on it and go public and then be vilified as a liar, a gold digger, uh, you know, for that. I mean, that is courage. This book is about the girls. This book is not about this man. He goes to court Thursday. Do you have any reason to think that it's going to be different when he goes to court this Thursday? I believe the state of Illinois case will be torn apart because it's about... Three victims who are cooperating, one who isn't, and I believe the federal indictments are coming within a month. A pattern of 30 years of sex trafficking, obstruction of justice, tax evasion, the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, and the IRS is after him. And they have interviewed, Gail, you know, everybody in my book. I mean, they, they are spread out. The book is very thorough, I will say that. Yeah. It's and very we, thorough. I do want to reiterate that R. Kelly denies it. Jim exactly. Diogatis, thank you very much. Soulless is on sale today.